Well, it's good to be with you all this morning. It's, uh, woke up this morning, and as was expected, at least the weatherman said that it was going to be this way. He said it was going to be a little bit more chilly, and uh, he was right. Um, doesn't always happen, but uh, he was this time. So it was I told some of the guys this morning it was nice to be able to go outside, and it wasn't just so sweltering hot, and uh, just really pretty, bright, sunny day. But uh, just you know, one of the one of the wonderful parts of God's design for our creation. But nonetheless, it's good to be with you all. It's good to see so many of our members, of course, but also uh, those that might be visiting with us uh, this morning. So we're continuing our lesson this morning that we started last week when we were thinking about the topic of improving worship. And remember last week when we threw out that word improving, when we're talking about our worship, I told you that there might be a a knee-jerk reaction to that thought. And what we mean by that is not that we're making things bigger and grander, something that's more physically appealing to us. Rather, our goal is to think through how we can make our worship pleasing to God. Specifically last week, if you were here, we talked about the concept of preparing ourselves for worship. In other words, if we recognize what it is we're doing and how important it is, we'll want to be prepared for that. So in this lesson, we're going to continue thinking about worship And now I want us to start thinking about our assemblies, what we're doing here this morning. And more specifically, in this lesson, I think it's worthwhile that we think about our worship in song. We've been doing that this morning already. We'll sing a song, Lord willing, here in just a few minutes. This is something that we do every time that we get together. So it's a good idea for us to think about these things. Now, I could be wrong. Before I was a preacher, I sat through probably hundreds of different sermons, and I heard sermons on different topics. But I feel like generally when the topic of worshiping in song is brought up, I could be wrong, but I feel like the bulk of our study tends to dwell on what kind of worship is authorized in the Scriptures. Now, of course, John 4 and verse 24, we just prayed this. You know, it does teach us that our worship ought to be in spirit and in truth. So spending some time thinking about how God wants to be worshipped, well, that's very important and valid. So we do need to think about that. But at the same time, I wonder if sometimes by giving the majority of our attention to discussing the topics such as, you know, the elephant in the room, instrumental music is often brought up. And thinking about that versus a cappella singing, which is what we see prescribed in the Scriptures. I wonder if we get so focused on doing things in the right form that we fail to give enough thought to matters of the heart. As we talked about in our last lesson, Jesus made it very clear that our worship, it can look right, or in this case it could sound right. But if our heart's not right, it's in vain. So first, let's consider what the Scriptures teach us about this worship that God wants, and then we'll consider some potential applications for us, but we'll also be talking to the song leaders here this morning because I think that's a a big part of this as well. So first, let's talk about the purpose of our singing. And I can think of at least two main purposes for singing that's mentioned in the New Testament. Now, there's some sub-points to this that we'll talk about in a later point, but the two main purposes I want to break this into. So the first, Acts chapter 16, we see that familiar story of the Philippian jailer in his conversion. And the way that story starts is it says in verse 25, it says about midnight, Paul and Silas, they were, in, they were in prison. They were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. So my translation, the English Standard this morning, it says singing hymns. Some translations actually translate that as singing praises. That's what that term means, is to sing praise. Uh, The songs that Paul and Silas were singing, they were songs of praise to God. Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 15 also makes reference to singing praise with the right spirit and the right mind. Uh, Hymns were one of those types of songs. We'll, We'll read this passage later on. But in Ephesians 5 and verse 19, when we have the command to sing, hymns are a type of song that we are told to sing. So one of the purposes of our singing is to praise God. When we assemble to worship God, one of the ways that we worship God is, as He's prescribed, by singing songs of praise to Him. We've talked about this point in the past. We could talk about it this morning. But suffice to say, when we think about the God that we worship, is there any doubt that He is worthy 
of praise. Certainly not. So that is one of our purposes. Now, another purpose of our singing is that we, or that it also can teach. Colossians 3 and verse 16, uh, you knew I'd probably turn here at some point. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Notice what it says, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Teaching and admonishing one another. And not only, in other words, not only is the purpose of our singing to praise God, there's also a purpose in that it aids our brethren. It aids one another. When we sing songs of praise, when we sing songs with spiritually minded messages, it's a way for us to encourage one another, to teach one another to live for the Lord. You know, sometimes I think we have this mindset, we don't have a, a devoted singing night here, but a lot of congregations have uh, singing nights where they devote you know, the, most of the worship to uh, songs. And sometimes you'll notice that when that happens, attendance may drop, and the thing is, you'll ask, well, you know, where were you? Well, it was just singing, you know, as if it's no big deal. But you think about that point. Our singing, sometimes the messages that we sing in our songs, even the ones that we've sung already this morning, sometimes those messages are better, are better teachers, or the words in those are better than any sermon that I might teach, or, or any preacher for that matter. So with that thought in mind, a couple questions to think about. What if we don't understand what it is that we're singing? Again, we're talking about the subject of improving our worship. This may actually be need to move up not just to improving, but a necessity. You know, how valuable, if we know that our songs are supposed to teach and admonish, how valuable is that teaching in our songs going to be and if we don't understand what it's saying. And I say that because I worry about, especially some of our songs that are written in a much older language. I wonder if it's very easy for us to just sing those things mindlessly. We've heard them all of our lives in some cases, but we sing it mindlessly without the understanding. I say that because I've done that. Some of the songs that I don't understand, uh, some of that older language, if you will. I think it would be really wise if we're thinking about improving our worship Think about the songs or think about the words of the songs that we sing. Make sure that we understand that we know what we're saying with those words. Another point to that is, well, what if I'm not listening? And I say that because I wonder if sometimes singing is one of the parts of the assembly where mentally, because we know the songs so well, we know the tunes, we do this you know, very often, I wonder if sometimes people mentally check out and think about other things. Even though they're singing with their lips, they mentally are thinking about something else. If we're talking about improving our worship, making sure that our worship is not in vain, we need to be thinking about the messages of the songs when we're singing them. I think that's a very important part. So the purpose of our singing is in part to praise God, but it's also a way that we teach and encourage one another to be faithful. So that's the purpose. So now let's think about what our attitude ought to be during our singing. Now remember we said that when we were talking about improving our worship, the answer is that we don't do something to our worship seeking to make it more appealing to us by making things perhaps more grander. I would venture to say the main way that we can improve our worship is this point right here, making sure that our hearts are in the right place. Sometimes I think man gets carried away very easily with the mindset that the prettier something sounds, well, that must make it more impressive to God. I want you to think about the Pharisees. So often they were those that would make very big, impressive shows of certain things, but their attitudes were wrong. So God taught them that's not pleasing. That's the lesson that's very clear as we see those examples. So I want us to think about how we can make our attitude more what God wants for us to show in worship or, or, or to have in worship. Now we said in our last lesson that worship at its root, what it is, it is a, an action that is a demonstration of reverence. So what is our attitude during our singing? Well, I would ask you one, is it reverence? Is it reverence for the things that we are doing when we're singing? 
How do you show reverence during our worship in song? Well, we can think about some ways that we don't show reverence. I'm a song leader. I also stand in the pulpit and I, while y'all are looking at me, I'm looking at y'all. <laughs> Somebody asked me one time, they said, how much do you see up there? I see a lot. Um, song leaders, they see what's going on in, in many cases. Not Maybe not everything, but song leaders know. You can often see what's happening during the singing. Maybe it's the side conversation that you're having with your friends. Maybe you're distracted by your phone or, or you know whatever it might be that's a distraction. And also to add to that, understand, I'm going to talk about something else here, but understand what I'm about to say. It's not, and a lot of these things are not hard and fast rules. It's just things that we ought to be thinking about. But we think about the subject of, of uh, getting up during the assembly. Uh, going and don't, <laughs> don't say, oh, I can't go to, Mr. Kevin's saying I can't go to the bathroom. No. Now, I'm not saying you can't go to the bathroom. I'm not saying if a child is unruly, you can't take the child. If I've got to go to the bathroom, I'm going to go to the bathroom as well, especially if it's an emergency. One observation that I would make and, and have you think about this morning, it's interesting that almost universally, our mindset is very different when we're talking about our public prayers versus our singing. Let me tell you what I mean by that. If you're coming in late, or maybe you need to get up and use the restroom. We all, we've all been there. That happens. But you have that moment when a prayer is going on. Well, how do we react? I think almost universally we stop, we bow our heads, and we wait. Very rarely during a prayer is there a whole lot of movement. But during a song, we don't really think about that as much, do we? And perhaps I think part of the reason for that logically is because the volume in prayer is a lot lower. It's quieter. It's more solemn, if you will. And we don't want to be a distraction. And I appreciate that mindset as well. But I've also always seen that manner or that attitude during prayer as also a sign of reverence for what it is that we're doing. We are approaching the throne of God in prayer. We have reverence for that moment. Well, as you think about our attitudes during our singing, you think about us being reverent. Maybe that's something we should think about as well. It's important that when we're worshiping in song, let's focus on what we're doing. We are praising the one true God who is on His throne. We need to show reverence. And we'll, that'll be a theme throughout these different lessons about worship, as it should be. Ephesians 5 and verse 19, we referenced this earlier. I want to read this now. Paul writes, he says in Ephesians 5, actually, let's go back to, to verse 18. He says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. We need to make sure that our singing it's done with the heart. Again, going back to that thought where we have this, you know, often we have the discussion, well, can we sing with instruments? Can we not sing with instruments? Well, don't focus on that so much that you miss what we are supposed to do it with. It's supposed to be with the heart. That means that there are emotions involved in what we're doing. You know, you think about in Acts chapter 2, what happened when the Jews were being taught about the gospel? They were taught that they had killed Christ. It says that they were cut to the heart. They, it hit them on the inside. And you think about that point that our singing is also teaching us something. Well, if you think about what it is that is teaching us, ought that not hit us on the inside? Yet, so, yet sometimes it's so easy in our assembly, we sing with everyone else. But yet the words, they carry no meaning for us in our heart. If we sing with our heart, that means the things that we are proclaiming in our singing, it represents our beliefs and it represents our attitudes. So I would ask you, what if we sing the song? We didn't sing this this morning, but what if we sing, I want to be a worker for the Lord. But then we leave the assembly and we don't work for the Lord. Did we mean it? We must not have. What if we sing a song, Father, we love you. 
we worship and adore you. We just sing the song Majesty, beautiful song of praise. But then we don't live like we love Him. We don't live like we revere His position. Are we singing with our hearts or just with our lips? Let's not be so concerned with making melody with our voices. I know there's a, that is a part of it. But let's not be so concerned with that that we neglect to worship with our hearts. We read earlier in Colossians 3 at the end of verse 16 there and talking about singing. And if you remember, Paul said that part of this is that it should be done with thankfulness in our hearts. So many of the songs that we sing, they carry with it uh, the attitude of thankfulness. When we reflect on what Jesus has done for us, especially we think about the blessings that He offers us, but, the, the, but also the salvation that we are offered in Christ. There's an attitude of thankfulness in those songs. One of my favorite songs, I don't lead singing as regularly as I used to, but when I did, leading singing before the Lord's Supper, one of my favorite songs was He Loved Me So. That, one just, that hits me when I think about the words of that song. When we sing songs about what the Lord does for us, do we recognize how thankful that we ought to be for His love and for His mercy and for His grace? That ought to be one of our attitudes. Also one more in James. We also see reference, James 5 and verse 13, to singing praise, it being a natural reaction to being joyful. Or as the English Standard says, it says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? That's what mine says. Let him sing praise. You know, a lot of the songs that we sing talk about the joy and the hope that we have in Christ. The song that I really enjoy is one of my favorite songs, partly because it's a happy tune, but it's the song, Sing and Be Happy. That song, it expresses joy that we have in Christ. Even when there are trials down on earth, and the way we sing that song, you remember that song, it's very... The melody and the tempo, it's a very upbeat. It expresses joy in the attitude of that song. I would ask you though this morning, do we ever sing songs that express the joy that we have in Christ and we fail to recognize the hope that we have? We're to express joy in our singing, but it ought not be in vain. Now again, and I mentioned this last week, I'll mention it again this morning, a lot of what we're talking about in improving our worship, it's an individual matter. Because it's very possible that we could be singing together as we've done this morning in the right manner. And some may be singing with the understanding and the right mindset and the right attitudes. But individually, some may not. We need to examine ourselves individually. Make sure that our attitudes are what they ought to be in our singing. Otherwise, it's not going to be pleasing to God. And it's also not going to be encouraging and teaching our brethren as it's supposed to be. One more big point that I want to talk about this morning. I want us to think uh, about, again, we're talking about improving our worship in song also as a congregation. 1 Corinthians 14, if you were looking at that passage, I'm not going to read this in its entirety. But 1 Corinthians 14, especially there at the end of the chapter, the church at Corinth, it sounds like at some points in time, it sounded very chaotic. Now the context in 1 Corinthians 14 seems to be very heavily focused on spiritual gifts within the assembly, but I think that there are some lessons that we could think about as well. In their case, it seems like you know different people would come, they had a hymn, some would have a prophecy, different people had different things that they wanted to bring into the worship. And actually, if you think about it, Going back to one of our previous points, 1 Corinthians 14 is one of those passages that makes it clear of how important it is that we understand what it is that we're doing in our worship. The problem with them was that the disorder and the chaos, that type of worship was not going to build up. They needed to make some corrections. The point is made in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And then at the very end, Paul goes on to say, but all things should be done decently and in order. So the understanding that I have of this passage is that edifying worship is not going to be chaotic and it's not going to be disorderly. It's important that when we worship, 
Now we're talking about as a congregation. We sing together. We don't need to be in a situation where this side of the room is singing one thing and this side of the room is singing another. Or perhaps you know, one part of the assembly is singing. Other parts of the assembly are either not paying attention, they're not participating, or they're doing something else entirely. That's not edifying based on this passage. Again, part of that's individual. At the same time, don't go so far to the other extreme that we make it sound like Paul is saying that worship has to be rigid and dull. But there's organization. That's the point, I think. Often one of the questions that is raised when we're having that debate about instrumental music versus a cappella music is, of course, part of that discussion is, what do we have the authority for? So it's often thrown back in our face, well, where's the authority for the song leader? Have you ever been asked that question? I have. And the fact is, is that you know, we don't read in the Scriptures about song leaders. And perhaps there are some different ways that we could organize our singing where we are singing together, all, all, all together with one another. But at the same time, we also recognize that there is a certain expediency to a song leader so that our worship and song will again be done decently and in order, as it's called to be in 1 Corinthians 14. Also, a song leader does not change the type of worship that is offered. It's just an aid. But perhaps one day we might find a better way, a more expedient way. But for now, that seems to be the best way to go about doing that, as far as I can tell. So with that thought in mind, if we think about our song leaders, I want us to think about some thoughts that our song leaders perhaps ought to be thinking about. And again, really most of these things are not... I didn't get them out. This is Kevin. This is Kevin talking. These are my suggestions. So don't take it. You, know, you can take this for what it's worth. It's not necessarily Scripture. But some thoughts for song leaders as we think about improving our worship. Well, first thing for song leaders, last week we talked about all of us preparing our hearts and our minds for worship. You think about leading in worship. Well, there's a certain amount of preparation that would be very helpful when you're talking about what we're doing. And we, If we have reverence or, or the right mindset for what it is that we're doing, we want to be prepared. Now, this isn't always the case. Sometimes you don't know that you're leading singing. Sometimes you're a substitute and you are put on the spot. That happens. But if you know you're supposed to lead singing, don't walk in the back door and just write down the first few songs that come to your mind from the songbook. I would recommend as part of your preparation, you may laugh at me, um, but Karen will tell you, and she just kind of tunes it out and ignores it. When I'm preparing to lead singing, I'm singing by myself at the house. Let me add to that, maybe read through the Psalms. You know, when you read through it, do you understand the message? If you don't, study it. If you still don't, maybe don't leave that song this Sunday. Maybe wait and, and study it some more and make sure that you understand it. Make sure that it's scriptural. Also, a part of the preparation, be thoughtful in your song selection. We've been talking about the fact that our songs, they have the purpose of teaching. There, are some, there is meaning to our songs. Give some thought to the meaning of the songs that you pick. For example, a good thought there is if we're about to partake of the Lord's Supper and you're leading a song to prepare our minds, well, maybe the song that you pick out needs to have that meaning thinking about the things that we're about to be remembering in the Lord's Supper. You think about the song as we get to the end of our lesson, we're going to offer the invitation to someone that needs to get their life right. Pick a song that has a meaning that makes people think about their state, that encourages them to get their life right if their life is not right. You know, if you know, I, I don't always advertise what we're talking about. If you, if you ever want to know, ask me. Uh, if you're a song leader and you want to know, ask me. Uh, but if you know what the study's about, it might be helpful to lead a song that might go along with that. I, I don't think that's a hard and fast rule. Um, you know, I've always made the joke. I said you know, I'm not going to tell the song leader what to lead if he doesn't tell me what to, to preach. There's no perfect formula, and song leaders are all going to be different. I like, you know, I usually like to start out a service with a song of praise, but that's that's just Kevin. I, just put some thoughtful or put some thought into your song selection. That's that's all I'm suggesting. <sighs> now, before you disagree with me, the point on the board if you're out in the parking lot is. 
pick mostly songs, mostly songs that people know. Before you disagree with me, hear me out. I'm not saying that we ought not learn new songs. I'm not saying that if we're singing a new song that we're not still worshiping God. But going back to that thought of things being orderly so that they're edified, I would suggest to you that sometimes too many new songs in one service it can sometimes be a distraction to what we're doing. The congregation that we used to go to, I don't mean to be dogging this guy, but there was this song leader, and I felt like his mission must have been to lead nothing but new songs. And often we would be singing the song, we would sing the first verse, maybe we would get to the second verse, but often it was just the first verse and he would stop He would tell us all the things that we did wrong that we needed to change. And we would go back uh, and start over where we had messed up and and we would repeat it until we got it right. This was in the middle of of the worship assembly. I'm not necessarily saying that was wrong, but as someone that was in that situation several times, I know that sometimes when people are are struggling to learn a song, how much are they paying attention to the message? More than likely their focus is on Let's get this to sound right. And we're not thinking as much about the message. Again, sprinkling in some lesser known songs here and there, that is fine, assuming that those songs are scriptural. That's the most important part. But for our worship, let's make sure that the songs that we sing are songs that we can think about the word, we can think about the message when they're being sung. Otherwise, our hearts and our minds are going to be often more confused then they are going to be centered on God. That's, that's the reason for that point there. Don't overemphasize being technically sound. Key word there is overemphasize. Again, hear me out. I'm not saying that it is wrong to know music. It's not wrong to be talented and understand music. The fact is, is that we are singing. There is a musical aspect to what we are doing. Therefore, you could also go the other route and underemphasize the musical aspect, and that too can be a distraction. But if the song is so fast that you can't understand the words, or you sing so slow that your mind wanders, that can be a distraction as well. Neither of those scenarios are good. Even sometimes you've, you've heard of song leader training classes, and I've been in those classes, and I've taught those classes it's also very possible that we can take it so far in those things, we take it far beyond what is necessary for singing to be done decently and in order. We can get to the point where we are just making our singing something that's more pleasing to us because we are overemphasizing the technicalities of those things. So don't overemphasize that. That, Not just for song leaders, but all of us as well. How's this for obvious Song leaders are supposed to lead. It's in the name. But as I say that, it's obvious, is it? I've actually heard song leaders be taught that really all you got to do is just start the song, and then after you start it, everyone else will pick up the slack. And for some congregations, that may be the case. This is Our, our congregation here sings well, uh, so that, that is partially true. But I would suggest for song leaders, not only do you need to start well, You need to continue to lead. Because often what happens is if you start it, but you don't continue to lead, what happens is is people aren't able to follow. You may have one side that's singing something else and one side that's singing another. In other words, it could get chaos. Again, there's an expediency to song leaders. It helps us stay together in an order. So make sure that if you're a song leader, you lead. Here's the last one. Don't draw attention to yourself. I want to tell you what I mean by that. Thinking about that passage in 1 Corinthians 14, one of the problems at Corinth, it seems to have been, those with certain gifts, they like to show them off. And the way I read that passage, it even suggests that they may have been competing for time to do so. Even though song leaders are to be leaders, the goal of a song leader, it ought to be to lead in such a way that it does not draw attention to self. And there's several ways that you can do this. You can do this by not leading well. That can draw attention. If something has gone you know, terribly, terribly long, I'm not saying it's wrong to make mistakes because I've done that. But that's one way. 
You can also draw attention to yourself by being over the top. I could be wrong on this, but when I've taught the young guys song lead in class, again, I could be wrong. I've told them that your goal in leading scene is to lead in such a way that people forget who is leading scene. What I mean by that is you can do such a poor job that people remember that, or you can be so over the top that people, that you're glorifying perhaps yourself. Being the song leader is not meant to be like you're watching a very impressive entertainer, not being like at a concert. Your point is to aid the worship to God. You know, there's been times at places that I've been where it always seemed like it was a competition between the song leaders. I would ask you this morning as you think about the purpose of our singing, is that type of attitude, is it going to encourage? Is it going to build one another up? Is that going to glorify God or self? Is that going, think about this, is that going to discourage other young men or other men that have not tried it in the past? Is that going to discourage them from trying to learn and practice those things? I'm not saying you shouldn't be talented. I appreciate those men that are talented. We have some very good song leaders at this congregation, and I want you to use those talents to serve the church here. But don't look to draw attention to yourself. Our focus is to be on God. Let's not lose sight of that. One more topic. I don't have this on our overhead. This is a topic that I hope that we don't have to... I hope I can scratch this out of my notes in just a short time. I hope we don't have to think about this much longer, but I want us to think about the topic of worshiping in our cars just for a second. I hope that we realize even just thinking about the topic of singing, there are a lot of shortcomings to our car setup, but I think this really goes for any congregation, even those that have decided that streaming online is an option to people's houses. I think this is really a shortcoming to any option that's not all of us being together in one place. I've sat in the car a handful of times and I've I've watched um, congregations stream their services online there at the very beginning. There is a lot of added distractions It's very easy for us not to think about what we're doing in our worship in song. Uh, And that not just in song, but really any part of our worship. It's very easy to be tempted to just, as we referred to last week, just to become a spectator and not a participant in our worship services. I'm not saying it's impossible. Just saying it's a temptation. And when you think about some of the elements of our worship, such as the one we talked about earlier, that we're to teach and we're to build one another up, That's a lot harder to do when you can't be seen and you can't be heard. We need to be mindful of this. We need to make sure that we realize this setup that we have, it ought not ever be a permanent thing. It ought not ever be seen as, well, it's a more convenient option that I can take advantage of. It does serve a purpose for this unique time that we find ourselves in. But if we're thinking about improving our worship, I know that our worship will be much improved when we're all together in one place. We need to think about that. Make sure that we're not abusing that. So in conclusion this morning as we wrap this up, our worship in song. For me, it's one of my most favorite parts of our worship service. It's all I, I enjoy all of it, but I, I really enjoy our singing. It's not something that we ought to take for granted. We need to remember the purpose of our singing is to praise God and to edify one another. We ought to be reverent, We ought to do it with our hearts with joy and thankfulness. And we ought to make whatever improvements are necessary so that it will be done decently and in order as it's expected to be. As we close here this morning, the invitation is extended to those that are here and perhaps you're not a child of God. I understand that this lesson has not been one of those lessons that would teach you what you need to do to become a Christian. And if you're here this morning and you want to become a Christian and you're not sure how, ask one of us. We will be glad to study with you. We want to help you get your life right with the Lord. But Jesus teaches us, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. So if right now, if you are here and you know what you need to do, and perhaps you'd like to do that right now, you're invited to come forward as we stand and as we sing.